Hi, everybody. You can find a seat. We're going to get started. Good evening, and welcome to the Jewish Museum. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs here. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation featuring Martha Edelheit and Rebecca Shaken, part of the program series New York Between Art and Life. This talk is presented in conjunction with the exhibition New York, 1962 to 1964, on view through January 8th, and I hope you've had a chance to make your way through the galleries this evening. There are still a number of related events coming up, both virtually and on site, including the final Art and Context, which is a three-session virtual class series beginning on Tuesday, November 29th at 2 p.m., and two concerts co-presented with Bang on a Can on Thursdays, December 8th and December 15th at 7.30 p.m. here in Scheuer Auditorium. For full details, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. We'll be using note cards to do the Q&A tonight, so you'll notice cards on your seats. If you'd like to ask a question of our speakers, write one down, and our staff will be coming around to collect them toward the end of the talk. And now I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Martha Edelheit is known as a pioneering feminist artist whose work of the 1960s addresses female desire, the body, and skin as a double canvas for tattoo imagery. She studied at the University of Chicago, New York University, and Columbia University in the 1950s and established herself in the center of the downtown avant-garde, becoming a member of the 10th Street artist-run space Rubin Gallery, where her first solo show was held in 1960. Through bodies of work, which we will hear about in depth this evening, Edelheit became an essential voice whose work implicitly challenged social expectations of women, as well as formalist paradigms and traditional notions of figurative painting and the nude. And Rebecca Shaken is an associate curator at the Jewish Museum. Since 2010, she's worked on numerous exhibitions, including the celebrated Edith Halpert and the Rise of American Art. Before her tenure at the museum, Shaken worked at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum and the Williams College Museum of Art. She received her BA in Art History from Oberlin College and MA from the Williams College Graduate Program in the History of Art. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Martha Edelheit and Rebecca Shaken. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Jenna, thank you so much for that um, really lovely introduction. Um, and Martha, did you want to start off with a couple of? Well, a couple of things I did. First of all, I really want to thank a few people. I want to thank Eric Firestone because he found me and has been showing my work and it's been wonderful. The, the microphone needs to be a little closer to your mouth. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. I want to make a few thank yous, which I think are important. I want to thank Eric Firestone, my gallery dealer, who is a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. dealer and who has taken me on and has really made this possible because this wouldn't be here without him. And it wouldn't be here also without Rachel Middleman, who, Professor Rachel Middleman, who has written a great deal about me and flew in to, from California to be here tonight. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And then I really want to thank all, there were all these people. I, when I wanted to come to New York this trip, I decided to come for almost four months. It's the first time I've done that in 30 years. I've lived in Sweden. And I reached out and I don't know how many people in this room made an effort to help me find a place to live. 
<laughs> and I'm just eternally grateful to all of you, and especially, finally, to Rebecca, who, <laughs> whose close friend, Sarah, has given me a place to live. So I'm very grateful to both of them for that. And uh, basically, that's, you know, I just wanted to extend my gratitude to everybody who is, and to everybody here who has been a wonderful support, and thank you. I'm really happy to have you in my life. <laughs> so. Thank you. Well, Martha, thank you for being here tonight and um, for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. This is really something of a dream come true for me. I've been a a longtime admirer of your work. Um, I'm particularly interested, I'm sure many of you are here, in your treatment of the nude over the past 50, 60 years. Um, I, your pictures of the human form and the female body in particular, they're just so wonderfully imaginative and playful and also oftentimes uh, very transgressive, highly erotic, um, which you were doing at a time when that was not really acceptable often for women artists. So we'll um, be diving into that and uh, taking a look at your, your career through its various stages tonight. Um, but to begin, I just I wanted to start off with the work that we have on view downstairs in our current exhibition, The Tattooed Lady. Um, so this is just it's a wonderful painting, and it's one of the first um, things that you see when you walk past our glass door, and it really draws your eye into the gallery, that bright blue background um, with this wonderful woman bending forward with her uh, fingers in the grassy ground. Um, and, you know, as Jenna mentioned earlier about that kind of double skin, that um, just incredible way that you've created this painting that's both of a figure and then the figure itself, it has kind of become a painting herself with the tattoos all over her body. So um, I want to just start out and ask just about the process of making this work and where this imagery comes from. Well, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, and I, 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 what is, uh, the date of this painting is 1960? 62. 62. Mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of watercolors. I was working with a lot of imagery of both erotic imagery that came out of movie stars, porno magazines, uh, and all of the gods and goddesses. I had spent a lot of time traveling in Europe. I'm, a, I'm an autodidact. I never went to art school. Uh, so all of my learning came from looking and looking and looking. And I think this was out of the Greek goddess Nut. Uh, and the tattoos came out of, I think tattoos came into my life very early when I would go to the circus as a child. And I was fascinated at the idea of people decorating their bodies. Uh, and I think it just sort of carried over into when I was working. And it was only later that I found uh, uh, some of the work the idea that, that uh, from Levi Strauss, where he said this was the first surface that was covered with images. It wasn't walls of caves, it was the body that was covered. Those were the first paintings. And I think that was part of, very much part of what influenced me at that time. So, so it's your interest in the circus. Tattooing wasn't something that you were doing yourself. <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> When I was three years old, my parents took a summer house up in Peekskill, and they rented it from a Fr French family. And the little girl who their daughter, Arlette, was, I think, eight, and she could do backbends and handstands. And I was absolutely floored. And I said, she had to teach me this, and she did. And, I, and it was part of this interest in what the body could do and then when I discovered circuses, it was what happened in circuses. It was the trapeze artists, it was the clowns, it was all of the, well, the horseback riders, what they could do with their bodies. And uh, subsequently, when I became an adult, I then did gymnastics. So it, it all wove in and out of my life as things that were very much a part of me. Uh, I, and I think a lot of what I've done with bodies came out of 
what my own body could do at that time. No more. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we've, we talked about this earlier. I mean, I think that one of the things that's so incredible about your work is how lived in your bodies f seem to be. Ow how lived in oh, they are. They're yeah. really, like, they're real bodies. Yes. Um, they're not just some kind of fantasy. And um, so, and you had said that the model for this painting is, this is you, isn't it's it? It's probably, I probably was using myself as, as the model for it, because I know I didn't have a real, a live model for, for this painting anyway. The live models started coming a little bit later, I think. Um, most of the, uh, and I was thrilled when I started with live models. That was such an incredible discovery, uh, you know. And I remember thinking, you could, when you have a model, and I did take a few drawing classes at the Art Students League, and I remember it was very, very inhibiting uh, to be in a class and have this body standing up there so far away. And to have a real live person in front of you, which you could walk around and really look at where the wrinkles were, where the fingernails really were, it was just astounding to me. And it was thrilling, and it became a very important part of my life. So. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the tattoo imagery specifically um, in this work. Ooh. I can't see. And, I well, now we can't at all. I'm um, uh, here. I'm sorry. It keeps um, cutting in and out. I hopefully uh, that won't be too much of an issue. But well, most of the imagery came out of kind of classic Americana. Uh, it was uh, and and also images I had seen in paintings: the the lion attacking the bison, or the the cougar, uh, the peacocks and mushrooms and salamanders. I collected these kinds of eft when I was a little girl in camp. They were wonderful. I loved them and butterflies I used to catch. And I was uh, really working out of also what I saw. Sailors, there were two people, two groups of people that had tattoos back in the when I was a child in the 30s and 40s. And they were either sailors or they were in the circus. So that was who, where tattoos came from. And those were the ones I knew. Those were the ones I had seen. And then I think I added a few ideas of my own as time went on. Yeah, that, that ship on her hip, it yeah. always reminds me of Lydia the Tattooed Lady. That, um, I, can't, I can't think of these uh, paintings without, without singing that song in my head. Um, so let's take a look at some of your other circus works because the theme of the circus really comes up for you again and again. So this is another, from the same year, um, you were talking about the watercolors you were so doing. This is a watercolor that is about, uh, I think it's about 12 inches by uh, 16 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very small thing. It's on rice paper with ink and watercolor. and. These were all pure fantasyville. I mean, they just, I dreamt them out. If, if you had asked me in advance what was going to be there, I couldn't have told you. I didn't know. I'd sit down and these images would just dream out. And I, I don't know what else to tell you about them except that that's where they come from. Yeah. I mean, they were pure fantasy. Yes. Uh, uh, another one from the same year, another a yeah, cropped it, image. Yeah. Well, this painting actually is now in the collection of the Moderna Museet in Stockholm. And um, I actually had not seen it since I did it. And I, one of the things is the, the watercolor has been shown. These paintings had not been shown ever. I don't think anybody ever saw them. They were in my studio. Uh, nobody was interested in my work back then. Uh, you know, they just, I just painted, and that was what I did. Um, so again, the imagery is part, part of my fantasy life. It was bodies, women performing, bodies performing in public. I loved the sideshows in the circus, which you don't have anymore. But back then, when you went to the circus, the biggest thing in the circus to start with was the sideshow. 
and you went to see what they called, the, in those days they were called freaks. So you had the tallest man and the fattest woman and the you know, midgets and everybody was, these people were all considered outside of society. And I think a part of me felt I was outside of society. I wasn't really part of it, the world that was around me. And I lived an awful lot in my fantasy life. And these things grew out of that. I was also probably the most inhibited performer. I, at some, one point, somebody wanted me to tr study acting, and I tried, and it was horrendous. I, mean, I, I just, I couldn't do it. I uh, love that all the exhibitionism comes out in your work. Yeah, so the yeah. exhibitionism is in the work, yeah. not, <laughs> not what I could do. Um, so this developed into also a sculptural practice for you as well. We I'm have sorry. your tattooed torso here. About, I'm sorry. It, it developed into a sculptural practice for you as well, the circus imagery and the tattoos yes, and all I of then, that. Yes, so, uh, later I was doing, I did a whole series yeah. of small sculptures. Yeah, so. so this is a really wonderful, it's a mannequin, isn't it, that's been um, uh, manipulated? Oh, and actually, and this was a totally, this, <laughs> I found this mannequin in the, in the gutter across the street from my studio. <laughs> so I found the whole body and I cut it up and um, this became, a, it, it opens and there's a medical heart inside and it's, but it's lined with chain metal. And um, I also did a leg covered with chain metal, which was one of the legs from the body. Uh, I was, it was like armor. So mm -hmm. this, this protecting the body from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And it was, uh, I, my childhood, I was very involved with all of the Arthurian legends, which I adored. Mm. So, uh, yeah, there's something about it that has a kind of like a reliquary sort of feel yes, to it. Yes, it yeah. is very much like a reliquary. And I, that was something I learned about going through all of the churches and museums in Europe, mm -hmm. which I had never known about before. Yeah. <laughs> and they fascinated me. And then, um, skipping ahead to the 80s, there's this wonderful series of, these are larger scale, um, flat yeah. but double-sided works um, that the, you were working on. The cutouts mm -hmm. that I did, uh, I did a whole series, and I did some of them quite large. This one is about four feet square, and then I did <laughs> some that were very tiny. Uh, so I, I have, and I have quite a lot of them, and I did a lot of three-dimensional works. <coughs> as well, so they sort of uh, worked off each other mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. so, we have a couple of examples you know, here. I love this this very cheeky reference to Manet's Olympia. You know, which uh -oh. was sort of fun because I saw, I was in at the Dorsay uh, two weeks ago, and <laughs> they had, the, I saw the painting again, and it was sort of wonderful to see again. But it was also, for me, these were very tongue in cheek. It was, one of the things that happens with these paintings, these uh, cutouts, was that I would do one side and then I'd be confronted with the other side and I would have to totally invent what was gonna happen on it. But I, again, I, and it's something that I keep finding myself reminding myself. I, when I start something, I never have a clue as to what's gonna be there until it happens. I really don't. So that, these were big four by eight sheets of uh, uh, plywood, and uh, I would look at it and I would just start to paint, and I had no idea what I was going to end up with. And then I would do something like this side, and then I'd be confronted with the other side, and I, I, I was never, I never knew what was going to come out. It was always a surprise, which was always wonderful. Yeah, it I definitely think, looks like it's planned. I mean, this this is just phenomenal. This next one that we we have up here with the leopard at her feet on one side, and then the elephant carrying a, a circus performer on the other. I yeah. mean, I I have not shown these pieces. These were all shown at the Women's Inter Art Center back in the eighties, I guess, and I but they've never been shown since. So it's. Though I think Eric Firestone showed one this summer, the, the cat, the one with the pussycat and the contortionist. Uh, 
again, I'd love to see these things shown. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody's seen them in 50 years. <laughs> so. We'll keep an eye out for them. <laughs> So then, um, and just last, uh, to take one last look at another uh, circus-based work. This was from 1991, the Bateau de Rêve, that you did in the Central Park uh, Oh, this lake. was a wonderful experience. This was a, there was this wonderful woman who had her ballet company and she decided to do this Bateau de Rêve in Central Park and she got permission from the park and then she asked me to do the boats, and it was just an amazing experience. Uh, it was very, very beautiful, very peaceful, and the boats moved around the part of the, the lake. Uh, I, I made giant clouds out of balloons covered with tall that floated on the surface, and these uh, wonderful pieces, which were all about uh, gods and goddesses, and it was the story of the ballet that she created. Uh, she's actually still fun working in Canada, I believe, the, the, the woman, who, the dancer who created this. I think she has a ballet company there. And is this the only instance of you working in, in set design and performance, or is this... I, d I did a number of sets, which I love doing, and... Uh, I would have, I think, liked doing more. I did one for Rosalind Drexler. Uh, actually, I think I did two programs of hers. Mm -hmm. And then I did, uh, I did one for Jonathan Levy, and I did one for, uh, which was Till Spiegel, which was a wonderful set. I had great fun doing that. Yeah. Amazing. All right, so we're gonna come back to this painting um, and the show that we have currently on view. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the exhibition. For th so for those of you who haven't seen the show, um, the exhibition really takes a deep dive into the New York art world um, during these three pivotal years, 1962, 63, and 64, um, which was a really important time for the Jewish Museum. Uh, it was when Alan Solomon was our director, and he was really pushing us to the forefront of the conversation about contemporary art. Um, it was during that time that the Jewish Museum staged the first solo exhibitions, um, solo museum exhibitions for Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, kind of launching their careers, um, and you know a number of other really forward-thinking, progressive uh, programming that was happening at that time. So we were looking at the Jewish Museum in this period and then also looking at what else was happening in the art world around us. Um, so bringing in some other works that are in uh, or were featured in major exhibitions at MoMA and the Guggenheim during those three years as well. You know, some of the first exhibitions of pop art, for example, mm -hmm. which was a burgeoning movement and, and starting to become quite popular. But it was also really important for us to bring in other artists into this show, you know, those of those of you in the art world who are maybe flying under the radar a little bit more um, during that time and weren't um, so quickly canonized as some, you know, the Johns and the Rauschenbergs of that era. So um, just to go back to the gallery view, um, so we can see your work in kind of context and conversation with some of these other artists. Um, we have Bob Thompson on the left of your painting, and then Marisol and and Louise Nevelson to the right. Um, I guess I wanted to ask if you could tell us a bit more about what your career was like in the early 1960s and you know, what was going on for you at that time and if you could tell us a bit about your relationships with some of these artists. Well, I knew all of these people. Uh, I was thrilled when I saw Bob Thompson's painting because his, his work isn't shown that often and he was an absolutely marvelous painter. Uh, and I was delighted with the Marisol whom I did not know well, but I did know her. I knew Louise Nevelson somewhat better. And, you know, as a woman, what was amazing to me was to be here with these artists and the other women artists that are in the show, far more than were ever shown back then. I mean, Rosalind Drexler, Marge Strider, uh, Lenore Tawney, Krissa. I mean, you know, these are not artists. These, you, People like Chris and Mark Strider, they had one show at Pace Gallery and then disappeared off the radar. Uh, and even Louise, who had a tremendous 
reputation for a woman, which I like, I don't like calling that. I mean, as a, as a woman artist, uh, and she, you know, she said, I said, but you've got Jan Janice as a great gallery. I said, you know, you should be thrilled. She said, oh, Marty. She said, you know, Bill de Kooning walks in and they roll out the red carpet. I walk in, they say, hi, Louise. I mean, I'm quite literally, I mean, it was not, it's funny as a story, but it wasn't funny back then. It was hard, it was really hard. And there were many, many women artists that really, you'd get a show once in a while. There were very, very few. Lee Bontecou took off like a star and was wonderful. Uh, Marisol did extremely well. It's interesting that both of these women left the art scene rather soon after they got enormous success. They did not stay on the art scene. Uh, I'm not exactly certain what, why. Uh, they, Marisol did not need it. She came from a wealthy family and she had, uh, and she was a very independent spirit. Bontiku wanted to leave, live her own life. Uh, but for other artists, Roz Drexler got virtually no attention for years and years. She was writing wonderful books. She made wonderful plays. She's a brilliant, brilliant woman. Uh, needs much more attention even today. She doesn't get the attention she deserves. And there are so many women artists who are not in this show who could easily have been in it and belonged as part of this scene because they were very active. And it was really only about 10 years later in the 70s that the feminist movement started. It didn't come back in the 60s. And when the Rubin Gallery, which is where I started, closed, I had a show at the Judson Gallery, which was because of Alan Capro, who was one of the few artists who really was very supportive of women artists. Uh, but I, and then I had a big show at Byron Gallery. And I must say, I have to thank uh, Barbara Kafka for that because she introduced Charles Byron to my work. And I know her daughter is here tonight, and I'm very thrilled for that. Uh, but um, it, it was a very tough scene. And, when, and part of my problem was that because I didn't go to art school, I really felt uh, that when all of the guys got galleries and I didn't, it was because I wasn't good enough. I never felt I was good enough, ever. And that has not really gone away. That's something that persists. Mm. So whenever I get attention, I'm sort of stunned by it and thrilled and a little frightened. Marty, you mentioned uh, Roz Drexler, and we do have uh, one painting by her also on view in our show Upstairs alongside Marjorie Strider. Yes. Um, I know that, that you and, and Rosalind were, were longtime friends, that you grew up together. Oh, <laughs> well, this, that's also interesting. I mean, people who could have been in this show, I mean, there are tons of them, but just you know, off the top of my head, like Mary Frank, who is having a show opening this tonight, actually, in the gallery. But uh, Roz, uh, my parents moved to a building in the Bronx called the Amalgamated when I was 10 years old. And the Amalgamated was built very similarly to the garden apartments that uh, were designed originally in Sweden. So it started at A, and the building went around an entire square block and came back to Z. I lived in A. And there was a girl named Marlene Bronznik who lived in Z. And Marlene's older sister was Rosalind Drexler. <laughs> and so I went to lunch one day at, with Marlene. We had the same piano teacher. And this girl came out of the room, one of the rooms, while we were having lunch. And it was Rosalind. And she had Sherman with her. She was several years older than I am. Uh, Sherman is now gone, but he was a wonderful painter too. And, but Rosalind was amazing. I mean, she just, she's an extraordinary artist. So, yeah. We had talked a bit about um, your efforts to get grant funding uh, for your work around this time. To get, to get grant funding for your oh, work around this time. That was one you... of the things that 
I was apply I applied for grants because I I needed the money. It would have been wonderful recognition and acknowledgement, and I never got one. And one day I mentioned to Rosalind that I had <laughs> applied for grants and I never got them, and she said, "Marty, I'm on those boards. Every time your name comes up, somebody says, ah, she's married to a doctor. She doesn't need it. They never even look at the slides. <laughs> that was okay." Uh, I think one of the things that you were intrigued by is I had, I lived three blocks from the museum. I lived at 1145th Avenue on 95th and 5th for 30 years with my first husband who died in 1981. And he was a psychoanalyst. And my studio was in what is now the, was the old Hotel Wales, uh, which uh, I was there for 25 years. And the building had a big sign on it for years. It said 10,000 square feet or less for rent. And I desperately needed a studio. So I walked in one day and I said, you have a sign outside. And they said, we don't show that. And I said, but you have a sign outside. And so he called the owner of the building and I could hear her on the house phone and she said, it's all right, George, she can go look. So, so I went up this beautiful little marble staircase. It's an old Stanford White building. And it was really had all these beautiful details. And there was this second floor, it was a laundry room, it was a junk room, it was an old furniture room, a sort of repair shop. And there was on the ground floor there was a Christides that went was the entire corner. And I uh, looked and there the entire area of that Christides was the second floor corner. And I stood there with wow, this was a big space, and this little woman came up, and when I say little lady, now I'm about the same size as she was then. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, I, I, I want a space to work in, I'm a painter. She said, well, why don't you take one of those small spaces? I said, no, I want a big space. She said, why? I said, well, I want to do big paintings. <laughs> and so, and that's how they happened. So I got, she, she offered me, she said, what do you want to give me for the space? I had no money. I said, well, $75 a month? And she said, can't you do better than that? And I said, well, I'll, I'll think about it. And then I thought, it's such a huge space, I could divide it in half, and then I could have twice that $75 a month, and I offered her $125 a month. And she said, okay. So I sublet the front half, and I had a whole series of wonderful artists in there. I had Richard Pusset Dart briefly, and. Sidney Tillam for a long time. Actually, at one point, Lois Gould and uh, Nancy Milford rented the space. Uh, so it was interesting. It was a nice. So all this time, I've been working at the Jewish Museum, and I never knew that the Hotel Wales, which is literally just right around the corner on Madison and, and between 90th and 91st right and 92nd. 92nd in yeah, absolutely. That it's our, it's our own sort of uptown Chelsea hotel, kind of, <laughs> that you were. <laughs> well, it had actually it was quite nice little rooms, but it was this wonderful old yeah. Stanford White building. So it had lovely details. It's incredible. Yeah. I love these um, pictures that we have up here of you in your, in your studio. So on the left, we, that's a scene of you oh, yeah. um, when still, in, still on Fifth Avenue. Yeah, so this was my fifth. My, when, when, my, when Hank and I took that apartment, it was the last rental building, building I think, on Fifth Avenue. And uh, he had his living room, the living room was his office, the master bedroom was my studio, and we sort of lived in the back of the store. So I never went in the front entrance because his patients did, I always went in the back entrance. Whenever I had friends to visit, they came and climbed, climbed over the garbage cans. Uh, <laughs> So this was my, the master bedroom yeah. in the Fifth Avenue apartment. And then it, it's hard to get a sense of scale, but the studio was huge yeah. at the Hotel Wales. And I was there, I mean, I ended up, I think my last rent was something $265 a month. And that was 25 years later. I, can't, I really can't. I've been, I, yeah. It's, it's just sort of mind boggling. <laughs> recently I, pressed I out of the city myself. I can't find a place myself. to live and work in New York right now, and I'm desperate to find anything. So if you 
anybody knows of something, I need to. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> running a little real estate shop up here. Okay, so um, so on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, I think you'll you'll see in the background it's quite faint, but um, you're beginning to work on some of your flesh wall paintings um, once you have the, that yeah. big studio space. So let's go ahead and talk about some of that work. So. I have to say that this this is the picture that made me fall in love with your work when I saw this at Eric's um, gallery downtown. It just it literally took my breath away. I um, I just couldn't believe how how contemporary it was. I mean, this was painted decades ago, and it still feels so fresh and so startling. Um, and particularly because I mean, these are figures that you know we've seen so many male painters over the years. I look at this and I think of. Modigliani, I think of Klimt, you know, so many men who paint nudes and women and none of them are able to achieve this level of just pure fantasy and eroticism that really, that feels really real, that feels really embodied in this way that I, I just don't think that, they, that they're able to get at in a way that you are. Um, so I guess I just, I wanted to ask about like how these paintings came to be and you know, well, it was interesting because I started out by painting wallpaper. I, w I, I, ha I had this thought that nobody had been really looking, and I thought wallpaper was very ugly. And <laughs> we always lived in apartments with painted walls. Uh, and I started looking at wallpaper, and I thought it would be interesting to paint walls with wallpaper. It, part of it came out of looking, oddly enough, at Pollock, who was covering walls with paint. And I thought, if you're going to cover walls with paint, it could be with wallpaper, painted wallpaper. So I was doing big flowered wallpapers, and one day it occurred to me that I could do bodies. One, nobody had done bodies as wallpaper. And that's really how they started. Uh, it, it, they sort of morphed one thing into the next. And uh, one of the things that was important to me, and has always been and still is, is that when I was working with bodies, I wanted them to be, I didn't want them to be idealized. I wanted them to look like people I knew, my body, other people's bodies, other, the, 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 that people didn't look like all the idealized stuff that you saw, even in Rubens with all the fleshiness, it, but that somehow it's idealized. And I didn't want that. I wanted it to be, I wanted it to have all its warts and pimples and all, all of the bulges and wrinkles that go with being human. So that's really what I was after, even when I was painting beautiful bodies. And I think a lot of these are beautiful bodies. But I, I think flesh is kind of special. It's beautiful and it's wonderful to look at. So, so you said these came out of you, your interest in wallpaper. Yeah. And uh, you had started out with flowers, right? And so I was, and here I was, of course, not only was I doing the wallpaper, but this is actually a self-portrait doing a tattoo on myself. Um, and I liked, loved the idea of a vase of flowers against a wallpaper painted flower. And I was very, I've always been involved with reflections and duplications. So looking in the mirror and looking in the back. So there's a calendar on the wall and my uh, work table and brushes and uh, in other paintings from this period I was doing, a I did a lot of mirrors uh, which were reflecting what was out there. Mm -hmm. So you not only saw this way, but you saw that way at the same time. Marty, did you say that Andy Warhol came to see this work? <laughs> he, when I first started doing, when I, I had just started the flesh wall, or I hadn't started, I had just about finished it. And I had all these, I had a whole bunch of these wallpaper paintings. And Lucas Samaras, who was my best friend for 25 years, uh, brought Andy Warhol up to my studio. And Andy was living on 
84th Street and Lexington Avenue in a brownstone with his mother at that point, and I visited him there. But he came up to the studio, and he had never seen my work, and he absolutely hated the nudes, but he loved the wallpaper. <laughs> and the next show was his flowered wallpapers. So, I mean, I, and I went to the show with the opening with Lucas, and we, when I walked in, I said, oh my God. And he said, Marty, he said, an Edelheit is an Edelheit and a Warhol is a Warhol. <laughs> that was that. I'm glad we have that on record now. <laughs> so we're gonna skip through some of the just incredible other examples of, from your Flesh Wall series. I love the way you have this kind of trompe l'oeil <laughs> effect with the ladder in front of some of them, some more bodies. And then in the 70s, you start um, to really close in on your figures. You get these more tightly cropped compositions, but there are still these details in the background that situate them in a very particular time and space. This is very clearly Central Park. You see the rowboats again. I think that's the San Remo in the background. Well, you know, I lived at 1145th Avenue, mm -hmm. which was across from the park. I had Afghan hounds for 15 years. They walked me a minimum of 10 miles a day. I knew <laughs> Central Park intimately. I knew every sanitation worker, every horseback rider, every flasher, every park department <laughs> worker. I, I really did, and they all knew me. I was a landmark. So it was, I used, I walked around the reservoir. I walked north, I walked south, I walked around the reservoir. So these images became very much part of my life. They were part of my mental uh, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they were very important to me. And they became part of the paintings. Yeah. I, I, I think at one point I wrote somewhere, so I said, you know, Central Park was my Bois de Bologna. Mm -hmm. And it was. I love so that. This is a rather big painting. Yeah. So just a reminder, we're going to be taking some questions from the audience in a minute. So if you have, I'm getting to ask all of my questions up here. But if you have one, please write it down and, and hand it to the staff that are circulating around. Um, I wanted to be sure to talk about this uh, painting, which is also very near and dear to my heart. I grew up on Central Park West, right across from Sheep's Meadow. So I never saw anything like this <laughs> in my childhood. But there was certainly like the sense, the sort of lingering sort of hippie era that you know, bled into my experience of the park in the late 80s and 90s. And I, I love this image. But I know that it was also part of um, a show at the Evanston Art Center in 1974 right. that the uh, Chicago Daily News wrote about, saying that it stirred up some silly fuss and feathers about nudity, and that in particular there was a lot of controversy over your depictions of full frontal male nudity. It's still a controversy. Yeah. That has <laughs> never gone away. Um, yeah, I mean, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about how, I mean, did that impact your career? like? How did you respond to that in the time, and you know, has that changed at all for you? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I was sort of, I was, I must say, I was sort of shocked, but I was as shocked as when I had the show at Byron Gallery, and everybody in the art world showed up for that show, and uh, Leo Castelli was blushing, and Billy <laughs> Clover was blushing, even Kiniston Machine was blushing. I mean, it was weird, and I thought, don't they ever look at nude paintings in museums? Mm -hmm. Don't they ever see naked bodies? Mm -hmm. Why are they blushing? I was really quite surprised. So this, though, I was startled at it. Uh, I also, I mean, and that sh I, I, I was also got all these people to write letters to the mm -hmm. Evanston Art Center supporting the work, which was quite wonderful. Uh, but when I had the Byron show, he, he uh, Canada came up to review it and spent two and a half hours looking at it and then went in and said to Charles Byron, he said, I can't review that obscene woman. So it never got reviewed. Uh, it was interesting because Marisol had a show at the same time and she got wonderful reviews, but she didn't have male nudes in her show. So, yeah, you said, 
Um, well, I'm taking a look at the time, and I know we have a lot more work and all kinds of things that I, I would love to talk about, but I, I do feel like if we have some questions from the audience, that now might be a good time to, to take some of them. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, let's see if I can read. Um, mm. How do you think moving to Sweden affected your work and career? It affected qu it quite dramatically because I moved to Sweden and ended up living 32 kilometers outside of Stockholm and uh, on a, in a huge house, I have a separate studio. It's gorgeous, it's a wonderful place, but it's very isolated. And I had no way of getting models. And for the first three years, I was sketching and drawing, but I couldn't, I finally, I think it was Rubens who said, when, or some, I think it was Rubens, I'm not sure, but they asked him, well, how did he decide what to paint? He said, I paint what's in front of my nose. Well, what was in front of my nose were sheep. <laughs> so I started painting sheep. I thought, everybody's gonna think I'm nuts, but this is what's there. And so I've, I've spent, really, all these years working largely with the animals I'm surrounded with. I have finally begun to get a few models, which has been wonderful, but it's been really only in the last six, seven, eight years. Uh, I have, my nearest neighbor is 500 meters away uh, that's rather a distance, yeah. and um, they're all very proper Swedes. So it's, <laughs> it was it was not going to be likely I'd get them to model for me. While we're since we're on the subject of of Sweden and the work in Sweden, I know that this was one that you had wanted to to share. I know most of your animal pictures are really quite idyllic, and I'm sorry that I did not um, include those in here. We just get the very violent, murdery ones, but. Um, I know this was an important uh, body of work that you had done right after the election in 2016. Well, um, actually, uh, every year, the, uh, my neighbors who own all these sheep slaughter them. And uh, it's rather a tricky, for me, emotional moment. And the slaughter occurred just after the election. And I went home. After I went, I photographed a lot of it. I watched it. I've watched it many times, but it's always distressing uh, because I get friendly with the sheep. They're my neighbors, and they're my models. And I went home and I did these paintings, and I thought it, this is what's happened to the United States. So they, I did a series of slaughtered, gutted, flayed. Yeah. But that's what I felt happened to this country. And it's, we've come through by the skin of our teeth right now, yeah. I think, and I'm not so sure it's gonna last. I'm, I'm rather pessimistic. Yeah, um, it's certainly, these works get at the feeling, certainly of how I was feeling <laughs> after that well, election. Well, these are very small. These are, you know, like six by nine. They're not. They're not big work. And then after that, actually, we do have one happy, happy image from your life in Sweden. So I, this is one of your most recent paintings. Yes, it is. The farm flesh wall. So this, I love this kind of return to the figure that you were talking about, yeah. and then integrating that with some of your. Well, this was a wonderful experience. This was the the family, and this are actually my housekeeper and her partner and their baby, and uh, they they are Nicaraguan. Uh, refugees, immigrants, they are undocumented, they are treated horribly by the Swedes. Uh, they come out and uh, have been coming out and working for me for about five or six years. And um, I asked them one day, I asked Diana, I said, look, you know, I'll pay you as much to model for me as I pay you to clean the house. Would you model nude for me? And she said, okay. And then I said, do you think Kevin would? And she said, well, I don't know. And he was very shy about it at first. And then he sort of got used to it. And Matteo at that time was about 
um, two, I think. He's, so they started modeling for me, and it was an absolutely wonderful chance to work with the nude again. So it was a one really great experience. And uh, I, I, I was telling Rebecca, I, when I started painting, I have not a clue of what's going to happen on it. And I think I started with Diana in this corner. And then Kevin came in, and I sort of started with him in the middle. I really had no idea how it was going to evolve. I did not know that I was going to include the sheep until they occurred. And uh, then the chickens, my neighbors all have chickens now. But these particular chickens actually aren't my neighbors. I started with them, but they weren't as good an image for me that I wanted. And these chickens actually are from my, one of my oldest dear friends who was living in Hawaii at the time. <laughs> these are her chickens. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> Very cosmopolitan fowl. One of the wonderful things about painting is you can put anything in it that you want. Anything that you want. Um, we have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, this is one, somebody who's asking, uh, who your favorite modernist painters were, the mirror work that we were talking about earlier. And who are, my favorite, favorite? Your favorite modernist painters were, so the mirror work that we were looking at was <sighs> reminding them of maybe Seurat or Berthe Morisot, um, and that the flesh walls uh, were indicative maybe of Matisse. Um, Matisse was a, has always been there. I mean, he's a profound force and I actually had a model one day who came to my studio at the Hotel Wales, and uh, I can't remember because all, most of my models were friends of friends of friends. And this woman had come recommended by somebody, and she was very pretty. She was uh, a une femme de donnage certain. I could not quite place it, but she was quite pretty and attractive. And she had a very heavy French accent. And she started to pose, and that was the last thing I wanted. I wanted my models to, I, they watched television and fell asleep, and that was perfect for me. <laughs> and uh, I ended up watching endless soap operas as a result. <laughs> uh, but she uh, was posing, and I was trying to get her to relax, and to, she said, oh, she said, would you like me to wear the blouse I wore when I was modeling for Matisse? And I thought, oh. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then I actually, the painting is in the modern of her in that blouse. But I, I, I couldn't work with her. I mean, it was like sacred territory. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Follow-up question, when did you know you were an artist? When did you know it was your destiny to be an artist is the question, and I'm going to flip it to a self-portrait. It took me years and years and years. Mm -hmm. I never called myself an artist. When people asked me what I did, I said I, made, I was a painter. I didn't use the word artist. Artists were, the word artist was for Matisse or Modigliani or... Botticelli. Uh, I do call myself an artist today. It took many, many, many years. But I, it's still with a little trepidation. I don't quite see myself in the Valley of the Gods. I don't know quite how else to Is put it. Is that because of like commercial success or having your works shown and exhibited or sold and all of that? Or is it... Maybe partially. I, I, that's a hard question to answer mm -hmm. because the, I, maybe the affirmation of the world is more important in some ways, or has been, as in terms of the way I define myself, mm -hmm. uh, and not having it, I was perfectly happy to just go along being a painter, mm -hmm. uh, and um, being. I still have that sense that being an artist is a very very special category in the world. It's, it's, uh, it was very strange. I, had, I was interviewed by a studio assistant in Sweden a couple of years ago, and I sort of casually said, you know, so being, a, being an artist is like being God. And that got the big quote. I mean, it was an article that got reproduced 
and published and so on in, in European uh, art magazines. And uh, in a way, I think there is that quality. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it is, it's, it's, there's something, you know, you, you sit in front of a blank piece of paper and there's nothing there until you put something there. Mm. And the first mark you make is suddenly changes the whole world. It's a very magical experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never, I've drawn all my life. I mean, I've never, I can't remember when I didn't. Maybe before I was two, I don't know. <laughs> when, so it's always been a part of my life. Been there. Yeah. I'm wondering if maybe we might end um, with you telling us a bit about the self-portrait with tools that we have up on the screen. Oh. Just as you talk about you know, your life as an artist and, and how you see yourself. Um, this is just an extraordinary five-part multi-panel painting, um, self-portrait, um, with this incredible and very strange kind of crown of of tooled, almost Medusa-like, <laughs> um, in their appearance, um, a little, a little violent and a little upsetting. Um, thinking of maybe these <laughs> these tools kind of stapled to your head or so. Um, can you tell us about that? About the tools of your trade? Well, and tools, be, you know, learning to use tools because I'm self-taught. Every tool I used became a self-taught process, and. I remember when I first some got my a power saw, and somebody and I and I, I was scared of it, and they said, "Oh, it's just like ironing," <laughs> and it is, <laughs> as it turns out, it really is. Uh, but they became all of these tools became extensions of myself uh, because I had to teach my body and my hand to use them uh, as casually as I used a knife and fork. And so they sort of grew out of me. And um, I've, I've been using them that way. It was uh, it, ever since I realized this, but I also, when I was in 1959, when I spent nine weeks in Europe with Hank, my first husband, and we were looking at image after image. Every church was covered with these images every square inch, many of them filled with the tools of torture. The bodies of the saints were tortured with tools. And I was fascinated by all the different tools that were used and how they were used. Uh, from flaying to uh, pinching to cutting to decapitating, defenestrating. It was very powerful. and. The tools are that, but this is also the apron, for instance, on that is an actual apron, which I hung on the painting, and it's one I used for a long time uh, to work with. So, uh, and then I finally, it got to the point I couldn't really tie it around me anymore, so I replaced it and put it on the painting instead. But again, that was also an extension. You know, I'm working and I'm wiping, I'm working and I'm wiping, and I don't, I don't think you think when you're working, or at least I don't. How big is this piece? Uh, I think each of these paintings is about, I think they're about two and a half by six, five, maybe. Five and a half feet, something like that. Yeah, large. large I, I th it is on my website, and it's probably got measurements on it on the website. I'm not, I don't quite remember. Um, it, I, I, there, it, of course, it's not this big. I think it relates, it's a little bit bigger than my own body was at that time. And I was about 5'4", so this is maybe about 5, 6, 7, right? something like 5 feet. So I think we're going to end with, um, well, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Um, and it wouldn't be a Q&A if we didn't have one of those. And it says, Martha Edelheit, you are way good enough, <laughs> exclamation point. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much um, for just so generously sharing your time, your stories. Um, it's just, it's a remarkable 
portal into this whole time period. And it's been such a pleasure uh, getting to know you and getting to know your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you.